Welcome to Watermark's Church Leadership Podcast, a conversation with church leaders for church leaders. I'm your host, John McGee. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, hey, friends, welcome back. Uh, I'm joining the studio again uh, with my friend, Dave Breskis. Dave, thanks for being here, brother. Glad to be with you. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into this. A lot of times, you know, there, there's an adage in, um, you know, in, in communication and writing, you don't want to bury the lead, meaning you don't want to hide what it is that you, uh, the point you're trying to make, you want to like lead with that. I'm actually going to bury the lead okay. uh, here. All right. And uh, we'll talk about, uh, after we talk about what we're going to talk about, why we want to talk about it. And uh, so to set the scene, I mean, you know, uh, recently we were together with our wives and, um, you know, I knew most of your story, uh, Pam knows most of your story, but she just never really heard you and your wife, Kara, just kind of, you know, um, share it, you know, in, in kind of one cohesive um, story of just thinking about your life, you know, the last um, 20, 30 years of ministry. And um, and so we, you know, we had some burgers and um, and you guys just shared. And, and it was uh, it was a pretty holy moment. Uh, I learned a lot. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't think about this often, but I thought, God, I wish I had just recorded uh, this, mm. you know. And um, so this is an attempt to do that, uh, Dave. And I appreciate you. I said, hey, would you be willing to share some of what you shared, uh, you know, over a hamburger? And you said, yeah, of course. And so uh, so that's what I love you to do. And then sure. we can talk about just kind of uh, the why uh, behind that. And so if I can kind of zoom in, you know, the, I've got this whole tape of your life. I, I'd love to start at the place where uh, you are going into ministry. This is going to be, you know, your, your vocational calling. You move to Dallas and uh, you've got kids, uh, you're working a, a day job, going to seminary, but you're like, you're on the front end of this grand adventure. Uh, everything's going to be great. Um, or probably, you know, I think a lot of times we do uh, at that point in our journey. Uh, and then things, you know, uh, take a take a pretty tough turn. Um, and so do you, do you mind just kind of picking it up there and, and setting all. that scene and, and talking all. about that yeah. season? Yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah. So we had, uh, we were here in, we were here in Dallas, Texas, going to Dallas seminary. I was working for an accounting firm then known as Pricewaterhouse. It's got another letter to it now, Pricewaterhouse <laughs> Cooper or something yep. or other. Yep. Uh, and I was in my second year of my THM at Dallas and we already had, uh, Karen and I had been married a few years at the time. Our oldest daughter, Lisa, was probably getting close to two years old, and uh, she was pregnant with our, our only son, David Michael. So he was born, Baylor, Baylor Hospital downtown. We had gone through all the ultrasounds. Uh, nothing was detected during any of uh, any of Kara's uh, pre-delivery work. And so when he was born, uh, they took him into the, 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 the nursery. I went back with Kara. We sat together for a while. It was late at night. She asked me to go get him out of the nursery so that she could she could nurse him. And when I went to the nursery, he wasn't there. And uh, the, the charge nurse looked a little bit concerned, a little bit worried, and she sent me down to the NICU, which was one or two floors below. And when I went there, I'll never forget looking in, and I could I could see him there, and a little guy, you know, had oxygen mask over his face, and his little chest was just heaving. And so the uh, the doctors there let us know that he was having difficult time getting oxygenated blood throughout his body. Mm-hmm. He was struggling to breathe. Poor guy felt like he just wasn't getting any air, and they were going to have to transport him to Children's Hospital, which is a little bit across town, but not too far of a drive. Mm-hmm. So I just remember there was no diagnosis yet, John. I remember being in the car. My father-in-law, Kara couldn't go because she was still recovering yeah. from childbirth. Yeah. My father-in-law driving me in his old Crown Vic right behind the uh, ambulance that was transporting our son. And I was just crushed. Yeah. I remember um, not so much being angry with the Lord, but feeling really hurt by the Lord, almost making this argument, although I didn't say it out loud, like, Lord, you've got the wrong guy. Right. Like, I'm, I'm here in Dallas going to seminary so that I can serve your people. And... This is what I get. This is what happens. I have a son that's not well, and I was confused. I was angry. I was sulky. And uh, long story short, he ended up going to the hospital where he was diagnosed with a with a congenital heart defect mm-hmm. in an underdeveloped ventricle, which kept the blood from flowing. The initial prognosis was good. The, the doctor sat down with me and Kara, uh, created a plan of care for him, but his prognosis was... He's going to be the kid when he's 14 years old that runs around the swimming pool, dives off the board, but he'll never be on the swim team. Mm. So we thought, that's okay. We'll gladly take that. Um, But after two months and four days there at Children's Hospital, multiple surgeries, heart surgeries, GI surgeries, um, 
he passed. Yeah. He didn't make it. He never, never was extubated. So never, we, we tried several times to extubate him from, um, from oxygen. That didn't work. He just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't survive without being intubated. And uh, I just remember that whole season being a lot of things. And one, I've never, especially the day that we buried him and we had his service, I've never felt closer to the Lord in all my life. Mm. The Lord is so faithful mm. and so kind. It was as if the Holy Spirit just walked me through every aspect of that day. And there was just such sweet, intimate consolation and care. On the other hand, it was the worst season of my life. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, left a, it left a big mark. Uh, was uh, was the origin of what was a long-term case of PTSD for me. Yeah. And so um, it really not only impacted our lives for the rest of our lives in, in significant ways in our family and in the way that we saw God and the way that we related to one another, but also I began to pick up on this theme in ministry that it's just hard. Yeah. That, that there's, there, um, there's, you can even hear from the way that I reacted in that car that there were some there's, there was some theology that wasn't right about mm-hmm. our understanding of who God is to us and what mm-hmm. it means for him to love us and what it means to be in ministry. And so um, that really began a path of, of ministry after that in which suffering has been consistent. And I think what I've seen since then is, yeah, that's par for the course for everyone. Yeah. I'm not alone in that. It's just hard. Yeah. And, and you get that biblically. You see that in scripture that it's just... The context of ministry is always hard. And so I've always loved pastors and ministry leaders because uh, I don't know that many people outside of th- their role and doing what they do that, that doesn't know them well intimately and personally really have any idea of how hard it truly is. Yeah. Well, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. And, um, you know, and there's still so much more to your story. I'd love to tease out just a little bit more, sure. uh, Dave, you know, kind of some of the, the different places you've lived and... and um, and some of the, the hard that's happened. And so, uh, so this is, this is for you, um, ministry leader, uh, that's on the front end of the journey, uh, to, I think, hope, hopefully, uh, calibrate, uh, kind of potentially, uh, how to think about what's coming. Uh, those of you in the middle, something, um, that are difficult, those of you that are toward the end and it can look back. Uh, and if you've still got questions about uh, your journey and for anyone who's doing anything of substance, like, um, to, to set the expectation that things are probably going to be difficult. And, uh, and I think a lot of times this, this idea, we'll talk about this some more, it's just crept in that, uh, God's going to bless us. He's going to make everything great. As long as we, um, serve him, there'll be some special air cover and we're going to have this blessed life. And it just doesn't work that way. And if, but that, if that's what we're expecting, uh, then it can really throw us for a loop. And so, um, so Dave, thanks for sharing that. I, I remember my wife just just weeping as you, as you shared that and everything else around that season is, is, is background noise compared to the loss of your son, but just to, there was so much going on in addition to that. I just, uh, I, I just can't believe like the compounding effects of some of the things that just kept happening. But, uh, one of them, uh, you shared, uh, I just, to give a full picture while you're in the hospital, uh, something happens, uh, yeah. back home. Yeah. Something really unfortunate. So, um, we had a real staggered schedule. We, one of us, me or Kara, always wanted to be there with our boy while he was in the hospital. And so we would go back and forth. So I remember when it was my turn to go home, our oldest daughter was being uh, watched by her aunt down the street. And before I went to get her, I thought, I'm going to run in the house real quick and, and just change, coming out of my suit from working at my accounting job, changing for the evening. And I walked in, I, I, I came to the front door and it was open walked in the house and the house had just been entirely ransacked. Uh, back door was open. Uh, there were things strewn everywhere. I looked around and everything that I perceived to be valuable was gone and everything that wasn't was just scattered. And so realized, oh no, we've been, we've been robbed. And I mean, rob line, like not just rob, but everything is gone. Mm. And honestly, um, That just didn't register in light of everything that was going on as a big deal. It's like, okay, of course. It's one of those, one of those days, one of those months, one of those lives. Here we go. Um, So we, we did, we filed a police report and then we later found out when we went back to the hospital that this had happened to several families within the hospital. So I don't know how it happened. Apparently somebody got access to families that were in the children's hospital, got access to their addresses and systematically hit up all their houses and all at the same time. And so, yeah, it was, it was discouraging 
And it was maddening. Anybody who's had a break-in knows just how frustrating oh, it is, the, the, the thought of violation. Somebody came in my house and took my stuff. Um, but it, it, was, it was a weird experience because it just wasn't that big of a deal in light of the bigger things that yeah. were going on. Well, I just, I, you know, when you painted that picture, I'm just thinking, you know, you're a uh, young dad, you've got a family, you're working, you know, full-time job, and you're doing seminary, and now your son's in the hospital, and then your house is broken into, and just, uh, like, that's enough, you know, I feel like that would do some people in, uh, and yeah, and there was, I, you know, we don't have time for it today, but there was, God was faithful and gave you ministry, and there were some, there were, it wasn't. <clears throat> not all bad. There were some seasons I think that, that God showed up, uh, showed His faithfulness and used you, and that that gave you joy. But just when you when you painted that picture, I just uh, I just thought how undone uh, that I would be. Okay, Dave, um, if if I can't, I'll just kind of see if I can get this the story straight here and, and move you some zip codes here. So Dallas season of ministry, obviously season of grief, uh, and then you're going to move around some more before you land up back here in Dallas uh, again at this table. But uh, next stop is where? was briefly in Seattle. Okay. Uh, it was part of a replant there, which was really an exciting thing. Then went back home to Albuquerque, served on staff of a larger church there that ultimately sent me and uh, a core from that church out to plant a church right yeah. in the heart of the city, which was both... Uh, exhilarating and terrifying all yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, we're really, uh, we're, we're serving folks that were very broken. Yeah. It's a really diverse church, actually. Yeah. There were people that were doing well, doing fine, but there's a real broken population and got to see a lot of hard things in that season as well. Yeah, so again, I don't, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to have any like, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not looking for salacious stories here, but yeah. I just, you just say I planted a church in Albuquerque and it just kind of lifted at that. It was, it was much more difficult than that. I've got several facts about that uh, season in your life that I love, you know, that I'm thinking of. But when you think about just things with this theme, things that were hard, uh, any, any of those come to mind? Yeah, yeah. there's probably a couple of outstanding stories that, that, that to this day, you know, I remember very vividly. Um, one was, it was the middle of the night. It was Good Friday. It was actually early in the morning, maybe two, three in the morning of Good Friday. I had a busy weekend planned. I was sleeping soundly with my wife there and heard a knock at the door, went to the front door of my house. And there was, we had a glass partition between the front door and the and, and, you know, screen, glass screen. And uh, there's a gentleman there pointing into my driveway and it looked like he was mouthing the words, your cars are on fire. And I looked around the corner and sure enough, both that uh, we had, we had, we had uh, some SUVs. Both of them were just towering infernos. Someone had come and uh, put rags in the gas tank, like oil rags, and lit them on fire. And so, fire department comes out. Um, I'm waiting for the police to show up, John. They don't. So I asked the 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 the, the person from the fire department, "Are the police coming?" They said they can if you want, but they typically won't in this instance unless someone is injured or there's great property damage to your house. And I said, well, I'd like to file a port. So a police officer came out and she was kind and she looked around and she just said, hey, um, who have you made angry? And I said, well, you know, there's probably plenty of people in, in that line. You know, where do you want me to begin? And she said, well, whoever did this really meant to hurt you. And so, yes, yeah, someone had set our cars on fire. We don't know who. Uh, we were working at the time with people that were coming in and out of gangs. And um, I don't know. I, I really don't know who did it. Uh, been shot at twice in that in that same time frame in Albuquerque. Uh, that's a little bit overstated. There's one time I just happened to be in the middle of two shooters. You were you and, were you know, the target. You, yeah. Well, and you you have in your mind's eye. What would I do heroically in that moment? All I did is I stood there. I was we were take Karen and I were taking our girls to the very first day of school. We lived on a corner. Cars were coming down both sides of the street. One car began to shoot at the other yeah. right across our family. And I just stood there with my hands in the air like, you got to be kidding me. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't run and dive. I didn't do any kind of monkey roll and save my family. I just stood there like, what's going on here? And the guy looked at me like, you better go back inside or I'll start shooting at you. And then had another instance where I came upon a robbery. A car pursued me and shut out my back window as yeah. kind of we were, we were making our way away. So. You know that those were those were those were definitely um, hard hard situations, and I think from a ministry implication, you you do question what am I doing? Yeah, like am I putting my family at so much risk being in this spot in this time? Uh, I, I I am enticed by the opportunity to see lives changed, especially those that it seems like few churches are reaching out to. But at the same time, I think in that season, John, I really began to see the toll it was taking on. My family, yeah. you know, the stress it put on my wife and my kids and seeing them in danger was tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, that feels like you've already, you know, we're 
not even halfway in and uh, it feels like you've already you know, had a lifetime of uh, hardship and suffering, but um, but it doesn't end there. <laughs> so it just seems to find your forwarding address. Um, so you you move uh, from yeah. there, and yep. good. there's great things. The church is still going, and um, you know you got to go back and preach. Yeah, twenty fifth year anniversary is so much fun, so, so rewarding, so cool, so cool. So there was God did use that season, but you move from there, and then that's back to Seattle. Yeah, yeah. So the church that I was pastoring became the very first out of state campus of Mars Hill Church. And when that happened, I went to Seattle to serve as an executive elder at Mars Hill, which is a whole other story in of itself of suffering and hardship and failure. Yeah. Yeah. Which that yeah, story is pretty public and uh, but you were ground zero uh in all that, you know, and um you and I've talked extensively about it. That was a tough season uh for your brother. But then in addition to that, you've got kid stuff uh going on yeah. as well. You know, I of my life experiences, it was there when we were in Seattle. It was one of the most painful experiences I've ever known. And that was our youngest daughter just began to live in a season of rebellion. Yeah. And her heart became very hard towards the Lord and hard towards me and Kara. And and in a weird way, I know all pain is pain and there's relative aspects to it. But John, I think that's the most painful season of my life, yeah. just her rebellion. And uh, by God's grace, he got a hold of her heart mm-hmm. and she's doing mm-hmm. good today. Mm-hmm. But that was a tough tough season of just not knowing what to believe and feeling like here's this little girl that I love deeply and dearly who just doesn't like me at all right now and is not being honest with me and I, you know, trying to figure out what's happening and what's going on and what I can do to change the situation all in the midst of the weight of the, the ministry of at Morris Hill Church and such a big church and a yeah. high uh, high visibility church where there's always controversy. It was It was tough. Yeah. And there's some health issues. Uh, yeah. In the middle so of that. after that, we we you know we came back, uh, went returned to the church that we had planted in Albuquerque. We invited back there to to, to be a part of that. Was there for about five years. Moved to uh, the Dallas area and, and get, became a part of the Village Church. Yeah. The Village Church Fort Worth was the campus pastor there. In view of it rolling off and, and becoming an independent church, and we were there maybe two or three months where our youngest daughter was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. The, the good news is for anybody who knows things about cancer, that's if you're going to get cancer, which is terrible, yeah. that may be one of the best forms. Very yeah. treatable, but that was a whole other season of uh, just deep suffering. In a beautiful way, the church rallied around us, served us, cared for us. We were in the perfect place at the perfect time to go through that. Yeah, The village church folks were just phenomenal in their care That's of awesome. us. But it was still a really difficult season, uh, really probably more than anything else on my own internal issues, really began to chip away at this uh, – idea that I have to perform all the time because mm-hmm. I was not productive. I was not in a healthy, great place as far as sharp mind on the cutting edge of doing good things in leadership. I was just struggling yeah. as I watched my little girl suffer. And so good news is she's uh, she's now been cancer-free for five years. I think she's got one appointment left with her oh, oncologist. Awesome. And if that goes good, John, she's in the clear. Praise so God. really grateful. Praise that has God. That story has a great ending to it. Praise God. Well, and now we're, you know, we're the sandwich kind of generation now, right? We're in between uh, raising our kids and caring for uh, our older, uh, you know, folks who uh, will not live forever. And, um, you know, and I know Kara just uh, recently uh, buried both right. both of her parents. Yeah, you know? Kara lost both her parents yeah. within a short time frame and dearly loved them. Um, great, great parents and the best grandparents you'll ever meet in the world yeah. and uh, godly people, yeah. Yeah. but hard. Another yeah. hard, it, what a strange season where you're welcoming new grandkids in the world at the same time you're planning funerals for yeah. your parents and uh, just uh, disorienting in some ways. And yet again, the Lord is in those places and his kindness and his mercy as yeah. well. Well, brother, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, I, so I knew, I think all those little bits and pieces, but there was something about hearing those all strung together and, you know, over dinner, I, uh, man, I got back in my car payment. I drove separately, uh, to meet you guys. And I sat, uh, I, I fired up my car and started, um, driving. And then, you know, when it's only happened a few times in my life where you just kind of like, you're, you're weeping and you're like convulsing, you know, and like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I was like, I was, yeah. I was one of those, like I was a hair, hair's breadth away from, wow just completely losing it, you know? And, um, and I remember just driving, driving home and just like this incredible sense of grief. And then, and yet, uh, it's, it was, it's a beautiful story as well that, um, that somehow God has, has been an, 
you know, has been present. His Christ has been enough for you, and you still. Uh, I just I, I, I ask. You know, I was, I was just thinking, man, would I still love Christ? Would I still love His church? And would I still want to execute on the calling that God's given me? And I, thought, I, I hope so. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but you have. And uh, and what what an encouragement it was to me. It was. Uh, it went from this blanket of sadness and dark to, you know, by the end of the night, as I, as I went to bed thinking about you guys, it was just like, it was actually really, really uh, hopeful. And it was encouraging to watch, uh, which, which, which is, you know, what happens when we watch brothers yeah. and sisters go through uh, hardship and trial. It's, it does strengthen us um, to know that it can be done, that yeah. Christ, uh, Christ is enough. So, um, but brother, that's, that's a lot, man. Mm-hmm. That, that is a lot. And I, my hunch is on the front end, that's not the way you thought. Uh, I didn't think the it was the way it was, was going. going. No, yeah. no, no. And first of all, you know, before I share anything else, John, you, you and Pam are such dear friends. That that night over burgers was such a sacred night for me and Kara. Like it was. you know, we 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 were probably the most thorough we've ever shared our story in any setting. And just the kindness and connection that we sensed from you, dear friends, was was a gift from God. Yeah, so deeply night. appreciate that. Here's what's interesting about my story, and I'll get back to the front end yeah. of it. It's really not that extraordinary when. When, and, and I don't mean that in a, I mean, in an anecdotal way. When I've talked with other ministers, other leaders in the church, yep. whether it's personal or people close to them that they're caring for, it feels as if this is par for the course, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, there can be different degrees, but everybody suffers. And that was my aha moment when I began to look at through scripture and, and probably five to seven years ago, just really wanting to reorient myself after the collapse of Mars Hill. What does ministry really look like from the lens of the Bible? you begin to see this theme, it's always about suffering. Yeah, It's always about suffering, whether it's from within the church, because guess what? We're saved, but we're all still sinners. So there's just, even in our own hearts, there's there's constant opposition that we have to fight against in the flesh, against the things that God wants to do. And then from an external perspective, we have an enemy who's alive and well, who's doing all he can to thwart the work of God. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that this is hard. And the context is always suffering. Going back to when I began, nobody taught me this. I can't think of a single professor in my experience or pastor that would have sat down and told me this, but this is what I believed. I believe there was this formula to ministry success, that if you just do the things well that God asks of you, on the flip side of that, or in response to that, he's obligated to bring about good things all the time. Yep. Church is going to grow. People are going to love each other. People are going to want, want to be hungry for the word of God. People want to, going to want to follow leaders who lead. Leaders are going to get along. There's not going to be conflict. Uh, we're going to enter into this nirvana, if you will, where everything works all the time. And truth be known, we'll enter into that space someday, but that's called eternity when yes. all is made right. And so part of my ministry story is I had to overcome the disruption and disorientation of having very false expectations, unbiblical even. Yes. You could almost go so far as to say, um, if there is something that someone calls the prosperity gospel, yes. applying the prosperity gospel to my ministry experience. And so that came crashing down, probably with a loss of my son, but it still was something I could get drawn to. If I'll just find the right formula, if I'll just connect with the right leaders, yeah. if I'll learn the lessons I need to learn, then everything is obligated to go well. And the reality of it is, the biblical pattern is, part of what it means to be a Christian leader in any context is you model suffering for those you're leading who are also following Jesus, Yeah, which means it's just going to be hard. That's right. And Dave, you know, so that was like an intersection to things that you know, God was doing in my own heart. And um, even as a, you know, I, I'm still a dad, uh, even though two of my kids are out of the house and um, two are in college. Um, recently, we were together for a weekend and I sent them some articles and some videos and said, <laughs> such, it had to be such an odd text to get. Uh, but I said, I want to talk about this, the part of our weekend away. I want to talk about the prosperity gospel, you know, and I, I don't know what their faces look like when they, <laughs> when they got there. Like, are you serious dad? Really? Like we're going to have fun and play games and be together. I was like, yes, I want to talk about this. And, um, and just that, you know, Dave, so that they, um, they're not pastors. Um, but I just said, Hey, this is coming. And here's an observation about um, about the church today. Um, the prosperity gospel is spreading like absolute wildfire, mm-hmm. and is probably the fastest growing, you know, kind of expression, or one of the fastest growing expressions, but probably better said, uh, of Christianity in the world. Um, 
And we look at disdain, um, we look um, in shock and horror at, at the, and it is, it is dangerous. And we may even do another podcast on, on that, uh, all, all of this thought around prosperity gospel. But um, we would say, that's not us. Like, right. those are, the, those are the, the crazy people. We would denounce that. Right, absolutely. And, and speak, um, you know, against it as, as we should because of its dangers. However, however... There's a version that has slipped in and you've just hinted to it. Hey, if I do my part, then God is obligated to do something in return. Now that's not prosperity gospel. That's just, that's a formula that we've constructed or that we wouldn't say that's not prosperity gospel. That's a uh, formula we've constructed in our minds and we, we execute on our plan until, uh, and expect God to do something for us in return. Maybe not, uh, mansions on multiple continents, but we just expect a good, happy, healthy, um, self-actualized life. And, and even more dangerous than that, the people that are listening to this, they actually, because you have a, a teaching responsibility, a leadership responsibility, you run the risk of saying that God is going to make your life great. Well, you can be faithful and you can lose your son and you can lose your possessions and your family can lose their health and you can be traumatized and you've done nothing wrong and no, nor has God. Uh, but his end of the deal is eternity. Not He doesn't have some deal he's cut with you here in terms of, um, you know, in terms of like blessing that I think has really seeped into uh, to the church here. And so, um, you know, I told my kids, I, I, guys, you've got to get this, uh, you've got to get this right. And we've got to understand uh, hardship and suffering well, because you're, you know, they're, they're still young, young adults. And, and I just said, it hasn't happened yet, but God, or, but life, not God, life is going to punch you in the mouth. Like you are just going to get laid out here. And that's not the time to decide uh, your theology on suffering and hardship. You decide that now so that when you get there, uh, you know, you know how to stand up uh, under it. But I, but I was just, I was just pleading with him. I think, you know, mom and I didn't teach you this. Our church didn't teach you this, but because you just are in Christianity in the West, in America, I think you believe that God somehow owes you and he, and he does not. And if you can uh, lock in on that, I think your life is going to go much better than if you're looking for uh, that blessing around the corner or that, um, that setback is going to be a setup, you know, or any of those kind of right. ridiculous yeah. things that are said. And it was just as a father, just pleading for them. And, and, uh, so friends, as leaders, I want to plead with you, um, to learn, uh, both from Dave, from, uh, the apostle Paul, uh, from scripture, uh, about how to rightly think about, uh, suffering, uh, that is inevitable. And, um, and it's, it's probably going to be part of your story and you've done nothing wrong nor, and God hasn't uh, left you somehow out in the lurch. So Dave, when you think about, uh, you think about suffering, you think about your life, uh, are there passages that you anchor on that, that help you make sense of this or that help uh, give you comfort uh, or help you um, kind of anchor you uh, during these times? Absolutely. You know, I, I think probably um, the, the life and writings of Paul are so helpful because, I mean, we, in ministry leadership, we can really look to him. We can certainly look to Jesus and look at his his uh, unique ministry, but he is Jesus, you know, and, and uh, so we look at those who follow him and Paul just had this continual concept of suffering that, and he suffered throughout his whole ministry. But, you know, one passage, two passages come to mind specifically. One is uh, 2 Corinthians 12, really getting to the end of the of him talking about his weaknesses and yeah. his struggle. And he says in verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content, which that's been one of the most elusive things in my yes. ministry, yes. contentment. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And here's the takeaway. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, suffering gives us the context. Hardship gives us the context to be entirely dependent upon the Lord. Yeah. And it's the dependency upon the Lord biblically that makes us strong. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily make us successful or fruitful or make the ministry numerically flourish, what it means in that space. Um, I'm strong because my strength is found in God because all my other sources of strength have been depleted, worn out, cha- worn out challenges. Um I love second, I love, I, you know, in, in a real simple way, in, in Paul telling Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he talks about, um, he gives the imagery of the, the athlete, the farmer, um, the soldier, and you get this, whoa, this is an intense setting. And then he talks about suffering and enduring hardship. And he says something that's really profound there. He says, I endure all suffering for the sake of the elect, meaning that there's ways in which he's suffering that actually are benefiting others. And I think that's what it took me so long to learn is 
everyone suffers. You know, here's the promises of God. Yeah, you know, we're all going to suffer. He will be with us in our suffering. That's promise two. Promise three is in our suffering, he will bring about his ultimate purpose. That is, we become conformed to the image mm-hmm. of Christ. So it makes sense that for those that are called to lead, one of their primary means of leadership is going to be modeling Christ-centered suffering for the for the sake of others. Yeah. And so it all of a sudden came together. Wait, when things happen peacefully for a season, when there is no resistance, when everything goes according to the proposal I just laid out for the elders, those are the exceptions in <laughs> ministry. There is no magic so, formula so good. where everything is perfect all the time. As a matter of fact, the norm is <clears throat> this is always hard. Yeah. There will always be resistance. We will always experience, as Paul's saying, insults and hardships and suffering. And yet that's the very purpose and point of God. Yeah. God is God is doing something bigger than we realize in that. So in some ways we should never be sadistic, but that's we good. really need to embrace suffering because that's where God does his best work. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, there is, yeah, you don't want to be, um, that's so good, Dave, that's some sadistic monk um, where you go uh, looking for it, um, um, even like telling other people, you don't want to run it, you don't want to make, uh, let your next um, sermon, uh, well, maybe you do, but you know, this doesn't want to be a theme of all your, uh, your messages, you know, uh, life is really hard and then you're going to die, you know, <laughs> like, that, that's, yeah, true. Sunday. that's true. That's yeah. true. And then also, you know, you can, uh, you can have a hamburger with friends and enjoy food and laughter and, and, and all those are true. So uh, that, is, that is a really good, just kind of well-roundedness. But um, I, I want to close with something in a second, but uh, the conformity to Christ when you look back, if that's part of what God's doing through suffering, um, it's this unique like megaphone. I feel like He uses. Is there, what, what do you? Uh, do you have any solace there? Do you have anything that you go like? I, I think this is actually how Christ was was formed in me be, yeah. through these uh, sufferings. Very much so. I would say that um, suffering suffering had such a greater impact in my life in in my own fellowship with God. I, I think what suffering does is it exposes things that are peripheral. Your life gets boiled down to some very basic things when you're suffering. You only have energy and time to focus on a few things. So your focus of God and who he is for us in Christ becomes so much more front and center. Mm -hmm. And things that are incidental, things that are just not important drift away. That's one thing. But I do think there is that dependence that you, I can't do this. Yeah, I'm hurting so bad right now. Things are so difficult. Lord, if you don't show up right here right now, and you bring about this result that I long for. You help me preach this sermon. You help me lead this meeting. You help me pastor and counsel this young couple that's suffering. I got nothing. And so it seems to be his lab for productivity is, is suffering. And so uh, I think we embrace it. Again, we don't seek it out. We, you know, it's, I've, I've been the guy, especially when I was younger, John, of suffering from foot wounds because they were self-inflicted from shooting myself. Like, I'm not talking about that. There's things I did that were just flat out yeah. immature and foolish. And I suffered for those yeah. things. And that's not yeah. the kind of suffering I'm talking about. Yeah. It's the things that are um, beyond your control, the yeah. things that God allows sovereignly to come into your life for his good purposes. And so, good. yeah, there's just something about it that, uh, and when a church suffers, when the entirety of a church suffers, whether that's through conflict or someone dies or something tragic happens, um, I've seen that collectively do the same thing. Yeah. People actually walk away from that and they look back in hindsight and said, wow, look at what God did through that situation, through those circumstances that seemed were going to be the end of us. Look at the life he brought yeah, out of that. Look right. who we are today because of our, the way we collectively suffered. That's good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word here in a second. I want to read a passage and get your uh, commentary uh, on it. But uh, so friends, thanks so much for listening. And, um, the, you know, uh, the thought is... Uh, well, I, I don't know about you. I need to be reminded uh, of this. This so podcast uh, oftentimes or something I need to re- be reminded of myself. Uh, so if you never know what to preach, preach the sermon you need to hear. Uh, so I am constantly in need of just kind of a recalibration about the, the life that God's promised here and the role that suffering uh, will play uh, in, in my life. And, um, and so friends, if you're doing something of substance, you you don't get a special pass. You don't get air cover. You you will suffer and you're not doing anything wrong. And, you, and those that you lead, you need to help them understand that there will be hardships and there will be suffering. And uh, God hasn't let you down. He's not been silent. It's part of the thing that he's going to use in his sovereignty uh, to make us more like him. And then we get eternity, which is a really, 
really long time and a really long time. And I just can't imagine a couple hundred thousand years from now that I'm going to be so bent out of shape about uh, some of the things that I, that I see as suffering now in, in the context of, of eternity. It's just not going to be uh, that big a deal, even though they are a big deal now and I can, we can weep and grieve with each other, but we keep, we live in, in light of eternity. So Dave, this is where I'd love to end. I was thinking about Colossians one twenty four was one of the passages mm-hmm. I was thinking about walking mm-hmm. into this. So let me read it. And then uh, I'd love any thoughts you have in, in regards to, to leadership and uh, any last charges uh, for those that are, that are listening here. So, uh, so Paul says in Colossians 1, 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking uh, in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So if we're not careful, that can be a word salad that means nothing. But um, <laughs> yeah. can you, uh, just yeah. la- last thoughts, can you... Uh, uh, kind of interpret that yep. and, uh, and just give the last yeah. charge uh, to leaders. You know, I'll be real simple because that's, that's, that's who I am. You know, what it doesn't mean clearly, Paul's not saying there's something in Christ's atonement that's lacking that he's right. making up. He's clearly not saying that. We know that from all the other scripture. What I think he's saying, John, is as he introduces Jesus to the people he's leading and loving and serving, they don't fully understand the extent to which Jesus suffered. And Paul is saying, well, let me be a visible demonstration of what it, who our Savior is for you. Therefore, I'm going to suffer. And he always has this perspective. This isn't about me only. This is actually for your good. God is calling me to suffer for your benefit, namely that you have a better picture of who Jesus is through my hardship and my suffering. Yeah. And so I think that... If we deeply desire as leaders, our people to really know Jesus profoundly and deeply and holistically and all that he is, then one of the ways we can manifest his greatness is through suffering the way he did through his power. And I just think that's that's par for the course. That's what we're called to do. We're called to suffer for the sake of others. What does that mean? We suffer through um, hardship in the strength God provides embracing the character that Jesus has for us according to his word and the power of his spirit so that others may get a better sense of who he actually is. Yeah. So that others may get a better sense of who he actually is. It's a great way to end, brother. Thank you so much for yeah, sharing your story. Let me share my story. I appreciate you. you, John. Well, friends, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, ideas for uh, future episodes, uh, we'd love to hear from you. That's CLP at watermark.org. Uh, that's CLP at watermark.org. And we'll talk to you again next time. 